How's it going, everybody? Have you ever been the person that looks at OSPF and goes, wow, that's a lot? I've been there. Anybody else that's worked their way through OSPF and struggles with it, you are not alone. So what I wanted to do in this video is give kind of a high-level overview of how OSPF works. And a friend of mine, a long time ago, probably 10 years ago if I had to guess, introduced me to the OSPF puppy. And as you can tell, it is a drawing of how OSPF works, the LSA types, the areas, the area types, the, carry, the capabilities. It doesn't go into network types like point-to-point -point or non-broadcast or anything like that. But what it does do, it gives everybody an idea as to what is going on. Now, what's cool about this is that it's easy to remember. Now, I, when the first time I saw this, I actually printed it out. And when I did, I pinned it in my cube wall. Any, at any job I worked at, whether it was a contract or not, I'd pin this diagram to the wall so that whenever I had to work on an OSPF environment, I could always quickly look over at this depending on what I was seeing. And I could, this was my quick reference guide to OSPF. This was huge. Now, I do not claim to be the originator of this. It was shown to me by a friend that I was in a study group with, and it lended itself well to me. So I want you to take a couple of minutes to walk you through why things are set up the way that they are. Because if you're looking at this at a high level, you're like, okay, this is a lot to take in. How does this actually work? So here's some of the capabilities that I wanted to go over with you. So first and foremost, you have the areas area, you have the backbone. This is where all other areas need to connect to in order to work. Now, I'm not gonna talk about if you have discontiguous areas. For example, you've got over here behind area two, you've got another ABR that connects to area 15, for example. We're not gonna be talking about virtual links. My opinion, if you have virtual links in your environment for uh, more than a period of time, it's more than likely a bad OSPF design. So that is my opinion. So we have area zero, we have the LSAs, right? And this is gonna be LSA one, two, three, four, and five. So I'm not gonna go into the LSA types themselves because even though it's important to know what each one is, it is not gonna be the only thing to care about. You have other, op uh, other operations going on. You have the area border router, which obviously is going to be the router that borders two different areas. And in order to be an area border router, you must have at least one interface inside of area zero. Typically more than just a loopback, wink, wink. So when we talk about some of the capabilities here, this is gonna be a standard area, meaning there is no filtering or optimization, if you will. So one of the things that I want everybody to, to be aware of is in every area you're gonna have two common things depending on the optimization level. You will always have a type one and type two LSA. Now, you won't always have type two depending on how you want to deploy. If you're gonna rely on ethernet media, you know, if you're on one gig, 10 gig, or anything that's ethernet based, you will always have a type two LSA because ethernet is a broadcast media. Therefore, it's automatically gonna the interface is automatically going to detect it as broadcast and type two LSAs are going to get generated. So this is one of those key things where if you're just getting into it, you'll always see type one and type two unless you move your interfaces to a different network type. So I prefer point to point because that gets rid of the type two LSA. There is no DRBDR election process at that point. So that's one of those key things there that comes into play. So if you, the flag isn't set, therefore there's no type 2 propagation information. So you'll to type 2 is optional depending on how you roll things out. So the other one here, stub area 2. What is a stub? Well, it's supposed to optimize the network, right? That's going to be how you would come in here and you would just get a default route and then all of your other routes, type 3, type 4, things like that. Then you could go to totally stub, which means you get rid of your type 3 and type 4. You get rid of your inter-area routes in your ASBR summary. So an ASBR summary is generated when you have a, because we're moving that direction, an ASBR autonomous system boundary router is any router that connects OSPF to somewhere else, whether it's the internet, EIGRP, RIP, internet, doesn't matter. B 
BGP, could be anything. The point being here is that at any point in time you are connecting outside and the routes are being generated into your OSPF domain, that router automatically becomes an ASBR. So the ASBR itself is going to generate a type 5 LSA for the external route, right? So we have that. So in the event that we have a router and an, uh, a default route being, or an ASBR in another area, you're going to generate type 4 LSAs. Type 4 LSAs are what? Those are going to be the LSA generated by the ABR to reach the ASBR. So if you notice, we have type 4 LSA here. Why do we have that? Because we have two different areas, area 4 and 5, that have ASBRs attached to them. So the ABR is a, your type 4 is a pointer to the ABR, which then has a route to the ASBR. That is what type 4 LSA is. What's a type 3 LSA? Type 3 LSA is going to be any inter-area route. Pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it's really not that difficult to follow. So some these are just some of the basic things that you'll need to understand about how OSPF comes into play. Now, the one thing that's interesting here is the not so stubby area. And as I say, what does not so stubby mean? Well, a stub means that you don't do any redistribution into the area. So it is a stub area, meaning there's nothing south, logically southbound of the ABR, right? You have users and laptops and printers and things like that and you will see type 3 and type 4 LSAs here but you won't see a default or I'm sorry you won't see a type 5 only a default route because you're trying to optimize the network if you want to optimize the network even further you can go to a totally stubby area and you'll get rid of the type 3 and type 4 LSA so you won't have any inter area routes and you won't have a ASBR summary either it's an it's a link state database optimization mechanism so you have that now if you jump over here to the NSSA, you're going to have the same breakdown as the stub and totally stub. The only difference is this one allows redistribution. But following the stub logic, stub areas don't allow for type 5 external routes. So therefore, they use type 7. Seven Type 7 routes are identical to type 5, but they are coming from an ASP or into a not so stubby area. It allows redistribution into a stub area for whatever use you decide to have. And then you have your one and two. Remember, one and two, you're always going to have, depending on your deployment mechanism, broadcast or point to point. You're going to have your inter area routes, you're going to have your ASBR summary, and you're going to have your redistributed route propagate. Now, what's interesting is type seven routes, the LSAs themselves, only live in not so stubby areas. The moment you get to an ABR, there is a mechanism that flips the type seven to a type five LSA. And that is the P bit, P is in Peter, or the propagate bit. So what ends up happening is you migrate that type 7 to a type 5 LSA, which is why we have type 5 show up here in area 0, and how, why we have type 5 LSAs show up in area 1. So that's essentially where that comes into play. The totally not so stubby area, you do the exact same thing. You remove your type 3 and type 4 LSAs. Now one thing that's interesting about the not so stubby area, unlike the regular stubby areas, is regular stubby areas automatically generate a type uh, a default route. So the stub areas automatically generate a default route where you look here, you don't see that. You don't see the default route by default. You have to manually define that. And then you can be specific as it's only supposed to propagate into the not so stubby area when you deploy. So that's just some high level stuff when it comes to how OSPF works in the breakdown for it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to drop a comment in the comment section below. Again, this is not my work. This is something that I literally Googled for because this is something that I was introduced to by a friend a long, long time ago, and it really helped. So if you want to, feel free to print this out, have it in your cube, or put it up in your wall in your office wherever you're studying if you're trying to go through OSPF and try to get a better understanding of how it works because that's essentially OSPF. It's really not that difficult when you keep it simple and straightforward. There's a lot of other nerd knobs that you can go through, but at the end of the day, the only nerd knobs you really need to worry about are the ones that the customer needs you to turn on. So learn them all when you're first learning OSPF and then make sure that you know which ones you can turn on and which ones you can turn off and how they work. That is what it takes to become an expert. If you want to be an expert, know all the nerd knobs. That's really it. Anyway, you guys have an awesome rest of your day and I'll catch all of you guys in the next video.